Let's go. I don't know what you're going through, but we stop by to tell you that what's in front of you is bigger than what's behind you. Your destiny, your promise, your future. You might as well shout before you get it, because God sent me here to tell you that what he has for you is gonna be big. That it's my season. That it's my season. You ought to declare that over your own life. Say, I believe. I believe. That it's my time. Good morning, family. Welcome to another worship experience here at the Mount. We're deliciously delighted that you have tuned in to join with us in worship and turning your living room into a life room. I want to thank and welcome all of our guests, those of you who are watching, who are not officially connected to the Mount, but you tune in each week and you, you share, you sow into this ministry. And for that, we, we thank God for you and pray God's richest blessings upon you and your family. As we prepare to celebrate Thanksgiving on Thursday, I pray that you are indeed thankful and that you're giving God all the, the praise, glory, and honor for the good things that God has done for you and your family. Even in the midst of your pain and your perplexity, God is still good and still greatly to be praised. Let us go to the throne of mercy and find a sweet relief the hymn writer said what a friend we have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear and what a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer oh what peace we often forfeit and what needless pains we bear all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer I want you bow and pray with me. Gracious God, we love you. We adore you. We appreciate and applaud you. You're a God and God all by yourself, worthy of all praise, glory, and honor. Oh, you are the great God, the creator and sustainer of all life, the giver of every good and perfect gift. And so our strong God, we just want to pause and lift the highest praise unto you. We say hallelujah, glory to your name. The earth is yours and the fullness thereof and those who dwell therein. Hallelujah. Oh God, we come confessing our sins and our sinfulness. We come asking for forgiveness that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness and create within each and every one of us a clean heart and renew a right spirit that we might serve you with gladness. We repent of our sins. We turn away from our sins and we turn back to you. So our strong God, we thank you. We thank you for all of the mighty blessings that you bestowed upon each and every one of us we thank you for being so good to us we thank you for meeting and supplying our every need we thank you for loving us so much that you did not withhold your only begotten son but you loved us so that you sent him to die for our sins for our faults for our failures for our fickle ways and lord we just say thank you Thank you for meeting and supplying our every need according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Thank you for keeping us safe from danger seen and unseen. Thank you for making ways out of no way. Thank you for bringing us through this pandemic. Thank you that even though things are as bad as they are, we thank you because they could be worse. Oh, God, we pray that you would touch our land. Lord, something is wrong when we can insert ourselves into situations and cause 
violence to happen because of our actions and then claim self-defense and and be found not guilty oh God heal the land open our eyes and help us to see the error of our ways help us to see clearly and correctly give us spiritual vision 2020 vision that we might see and if we see something Lord help us to say something if it's good help us to say something if it's bad help us to say something oh God we love you we thank you we ask that you would help us to surrender our lives unto you help us to yield ourselves to your Holy Spirit that we might be instruments in your hands of righteousness and help us not to present our members as instruments of unrighteousness oh Lord we love you have your way in this place have your way in our lives have your way in this worship be glorified in all that we say and all that we do we ask it in the mighty matchless name of your darling son Jesus and all who love the Lord and agree with this prayer said amen Amen and amen. Praise the Lord, Mount Mariah. Come on, let's give God some praise. It's time to tell him thank you. Hallelujah. Tragedies are commonplace. All kinds of diseases, people are slipping away. Economies down, people can't get enough pay. But as for me, all I can say is, thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. Yeah, yeah. Folks without home, living out in the streets, and the drug habits some say they just can't be. Muggers and robbers, no place seem to be safe. But you've been my protection every step.
Thank you. Oh, come on, thank the Lord for all he's done for you. Oh, he's done so many things, so many wondrous and wonderful things for you. Things that we didn't deserve, but yet he did it. It could have been me and you outdoors. No food, no clothes. It could have been me or you. But because God has been so good. Because God has been so faithful. We're not outdoors and we do have clothes. Are you thankful? Oh, come on. If you're thankful, bless God. Put those blessed hands together and give our great God a great praise for all the things that he has done for you. Come on and bless God for the praise team. Bless God for the band, the musicians. Now bless God for you. Give God praise for you and your family. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, and amen. If you have your Bibles, would you go with us to the gospel according to Matthew? Matthew chapter number six. And for the benefit of brevity and the sake of our subject, I want to key in on one particular verse for your consideration during this sermonic moment, this preaching moment. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 33 from the New Revival, I'm sorry, from the New International Version, the New International Version of God's Word. If you're physically able, wherever you are, would you stand in honor of the Word of God? And it reads, but seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. I'm going to read that again. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Sisters and brothers, for the next few moments that are ours to share, I simply want to talk to you from this thought, this theme, the pursuit of happiness. Let the church say the pursuit of happiness. Type that in the chat, the pursuit of happiness. And sisters and brothers, uh, Several years back, Will Smith starred in a movie called The Pursuit of Happiness. This movie was based on the real life story of a man by the name of Chris Gardner. The movie highlights the various vicissitudes that Mr. Gardner faced, experienced in his life. The movie is a real tearjerker because all of us know what it is to suffer the pain and perplexity and the despondency and the despair that can come from the, the, the hard times that life can throw us in. Mr. Gardner said that he thought about that line in the Declaration of Independence that talked about the unalienable rights of man which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And Thomas Jefferson, who penned the Declaration of Independence, felt that every white man should have the right to pursue happiness. And you say, well, preacher, how can you say that? Because he wrote that every man, the unalienable rights of every man. Well, I can say that because he owned slaves. And since he owned slaves, 
I don't think that he meant that every man, including the black man, his unalienable rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. No, but what Jefferson wrote was correct. That the unalienable rights of humans, of human beings, no matter what their color, creed, class, are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The actualization of that happiness was not necessarily a right, but the pursuit of it should be. In other words, no one should be prevented from pursuing happiness as long as their pursuit doesn't harm or hurt someone else. Aristotle, that great Greek philosopher of antiquity, said in his work, The Nicomachean Ethics, that every action and similarly, every pursuit of man, of humanity, is aimed at some good. In other words, what Aristotle was saying was that every action or pursuit done by human beings as in, was in an effort to pursue or attain some good. And the pursuit, and especially the attaining of the good, brought happiness. The problem that we face as human beings is that often our pursuits, although they may feel good to us, are not always good for us. And the things that we think will bring happiness oftentimes don't. We turn to many things in our pursuit of happiness. We turn to drugs, to alcohol, to sex, to relationships, to family, to money, Careers, cars, cribs, clothes, cash, people, and a myriad of other things. And while some of these pursuits are healthier than others, and, and while some of them can be beneficial, they all have something in common. And that is that they are not lasting. And if your happiness, if my happiness is based on any of the aforementioned things, then the question that I have for you is what happens to your happiness if the things your happiness is, your happiness is based on no longer exists? What happens when the things that your happiness is based upon don't last? What, what happens when your relationship uh, goes south? What, what happens when your career uh, goes kaput? What happens when your bank account or your portfolio are in the negative? What, what happens when your looks that you took so much pride in and, and brought you so much happiness, what happens when they begin to change? What happens when you, when you have uh, no followers on, on Facebook and no followers uh, in life? What happens? My brothers and sisters, when the things that uh, bring you happiness don't last. And I submit to you that most of us have been looking for happiness in all the wrong places. Here we are in this holiday season approaching Thanksgiving Day on Thursday. We're going to gather around the table with family and friends. And, and many of us, for the first time since the pandemic began, so we're excited, looking forward to being able to fellowship this year because we couldn't last year. Some people, uh, there are going to be some empty seats around the table because of the pandemic. And so even though uh, this is supposed to be a time of feasting and fellowship and football, uh, my brothers and sisters, for a lot of people, for most people, Thanksgiving is anything but happy. And the majority, a recent survey suggests that a majority of Americans are anything but happy. And I believe, I believe the reason is because we are practicing and pursuing the wrong things. But I'm glad this morning, my brothers and sisters, that even though we may not always know what would truly make us happy that we have a God who knows us better than we know ourselves 
And because he is our shepherd, we don't have to lean to our own understanding. But in all of our ways, we can acknowledge him and, and trust that he will direct our path. Oh, because he's our shepherd. He leads us in the right path, a path of righteousness for his name's sake. Like I heard a preacher say, because it's like Vidal Sassoon. If you don't look good, then he doesn't look good. Jesus said it like this. I came that you might have life and that life more abundantly. But the problem is that most of us live to the left side of the equation. And my brothers and sisters, on the left side of the equation, says uh, Jesus says that I came that you might have life but I want to live on the right side of the comma I want to live on the abundant life side of the of the comma of the equation oh I want all that God has for me the good and the bad yes I said it the good and the bad because when God sins or allows the bad to come into our life God only sends two kinds of storms correcting storms and perfecting storms so if God allows it if God sent it then guess what all things work together for the good to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose so the question is this since we all pursue happiness on a daily basis all of us want to be happy and all of us want to have a happy thanksgiving how, my brothers and sisters, can we find happiness not just during Thanksgiving, but happiness that will last a lifetime? And if you're interested in answering that question with me, will you peruse this pericope with me? Because I believe that this pericope gives us some clues, some practical uh, positions that you and I can take that will help us in our pursuit of happiness. Oh, my brothers and sisters, this sixth chapter of the book of Matthew is part of what's commonly referred to as the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount or the Beatitudes. That word Beatitude means blessed. And it's interesting that we find out how to achieve real happiness in this section of sacred scripture that has been characterized as the pericope of blessings and so the first thing that I see in the text that will help you and I in our pursuit of happiness is the first thing we need to watch what we're storing back up with me to verse 19 of chapter 6 in Matthew's gospel uh, Jesus says don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break in and steal. Verse 20 says, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust does not corrupt and thieves can't break in and steal. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves this morning is, what are we storing? Some of us are storing up clothes, shoes, pocketbooks, uh, cars, cribs, cash, women, men. So some, some of us feel like these things define us. Walking around with designer purses and, and pocketbooks, Gucci, Louis, Chanel, that cost thousands of dollars but you ain't got a dollar in the pocketbook or your bank account. You look good, but you don't feel good because you're broke. Your arm is about to break from holding the purse so high so everybody can see it, muscle in one arm bigger than the other because you want people to think more of you because of the purse or the clothes or the shoes or the car that you drive, the neighborhood you live in, the, the, the digits in your bank account or your network. Robbing Peter to pay Paul just so you can have material things. How is it that we let the things we possess define us? Uh, could it be because instead of possessing things, we've allowed things to possess us? Don't get me wrong. I like nice things. 
And God doesn't have a problem with you and I having nice things. But he does have a problem with uh, things having us. When your life's ambition is to pursue things because you feel that it makes you better, then you'll try to acquire those things by any means necessary. You commit fraud and brag about scamming because you are trying to store up treasures on earth. You, you, when you don't think life is worth living because you can't buy what you want when you want, then you turn to illegal and immoral activity in order to get the things you want when God wants to give it to you, but you're going about trying to get it the wrong way. Everything you're doing could be legal. It could be ethical. But if you do what you do just to acquire things, God has a problem with that too. God is not concerned about how big or how nice our home is. God is not concerned about whether we wear St. John or, or Sean John. That's not important to God. Your value to God ain't in your bank account. Or in your stock portfolio. What's important to him is your relationship with him. He wants to be in a loving and committed relationship with us. Not just a one night or two night stand. Uh, he wants to know uh, how you feel about Jesus. Because he loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son because it's not his will that any of us should perish but that we might have everlasting life i got men we storing up women trying to have as many women as we can when we can't hardly take care of the one we got i know you don't like what i'm saying but i know i'm right we're trying to store up money not so that we can be a blessing to others but to be able to say my bank account is bigger than yours. Young people, this is a trick of the enemy to try to get you to think that your value is tied up in your valuables. But I need you to understand your valuables are not what make you valuable. All the hip hop generation talks about is getting things and having drip. But life is more than that. And I say again, what happens? When your money is gone and you have to sell your drip to try to make ends meet, are you still valuable? Are you still happy? What happens when that relationship ends? Uh, are you still happy? What happens, preacher? How can we store up treasures in heaven? And when the text is silent, Jesus just says, don't store of treasure on earth but store them up in heaven if I'm on earth how can I store up treasures in heaven well I'm glad that you asked because we can store up treasures in heaven while on earth uh, by being uh, what God called and created us to be we can store up treasures in heaven by treating our brothers and sisters right by, by treating our fellow human beings the way that we would want to be treated. You store up treasure by loving your neighbor as yourself. You store up treasure in heaven by loving your enemies. You store up treasure in heaven by truly valuing all lives, by making sure that no one is denied an opportunity to pursue happiness. A preacher, how is doing all these Storing up treasure in heaven. Well, you do remember that Jesus declared that everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, ain't coming in. And then he said that those who were coming in are the ones who uh, fed him, came to see about him when he was hungry, gave him something to eat, gave him something to drink when he was thirsty, uh, came and bandaged his wounds to see about him when he was sick, came and put something on his books when he was in prison. And Jesus said that those are the ones who are storing up treasures in heaven. How, he didn't use those words, but what he said was that those are the ones who would be granted admission 
into the kingdom. And then he said that they, they asked him, Lord, when do we do all that stuff for you? And then Jesus said, and as much as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. But not only does the text teach us in our pursuit of happiness that we need to watch what we're storing, but it also teaches us that we need to watch how we are seeing. The text says in verse 22 and 23, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, if thine eye be single, in the Greek, aplos, which means unclouded, sound, whole, or perfect, then your body will be full of light. But if your eye be full of darkness, poniros, in the Greek, which means evil, then your whole body will be evil. Then if the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? The idea in ancient times was that the eyes were like a lamp unto the soul. We know that a lamp is used to illuminate things to help us to see better. So the idea conveyed in this passage of scripture is how, how clear do we see things? When people, when we see people doing wrong, do we see clearly that it's against the word of God or do we turn a blind eye and say it's okay? When we see men cheating, husbands cheating on their wives, do we say that it's wrong or do we say that's just men being men? When, when, when we have people who, who, who abuse women, who just walk up and grab them by the privates. Do we, do we say it's wrong when we, when we see that or do we say it's locker room talk? Uh, when, we, when we see children dancing like they're getting ready for the strip club and shaking what their mama gave them and then remembering the lyrics to all the hip-hop songs but can't remember to do their homework or clean up their room. Do we see that and say it's wrong and, and something needs to change or do we say that's just, that's cute, that's just children being children? When we see politicians serving their own interest instead of the interests of all their constituents, do we see the need to hold them accountable or do we enable them to continue to serve their own interests by our apathy and lack of involvement in the political process? When we see that we are not being obedient to the word and the will of God, do we try to excuse it with God knows my heart? How are you seeing? Are we walking by sight or are we walking by faith? We've all heard the slogan that says seeing is believing. But that's not how it works in God's economy. God says that believing is seeing. God says when you trust me, when you obey me, when you walk by faith, I'll show you some great and mighty things. That's why the hymn writer said that some things we'll understand better by and by. But we need to watch how we are seeing. And Jesus said, "If how can you tell somebody about the speck in their eye while ignoring the plank in your own eye. So we got to make sure that we dealt with the plank in our eyes before we try to deal with the speck in our brother's eyes. In other words, how are we going to tell someone how to take care of their issues when we haven't taken care of our own? How are you going to tell someone they need to fix their marriage but you ain't fixed yours? We need to watch how we're seeing. And I don't know about you, but I've seen the Lord do some mighty things in my life. I can testify like the psalmist that I've been young. And I'm not old, but I'm older. And I still haven't seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. And if you like me have seen the Lord do some great 
and mighty things, then you ought to be able to give uh, God praise right where you are in the midst of what you're going through because God has done some great and mighty things and you've seen it. And if you've seen God do some great and mighty things, then that ought to give you the confidence that if God did it before, that God can do it again. If he did a great and mighty thing yesterday, he can do a great and mighty thing in your life today. If you've seen God ever turn your frown upside down, he can turn it upside down today. God can heal and deliver. If he healed and delivered in the past, he can heal. And if you've seen God make a way out of no way, then you ought to be able to shout because you've seen it. My brothers and sisters, and I told you, in God's economy, believing is seeing. And you saw it because you believed. And I just need you to keep on believing so that you can keep on seeing. But not only in our pursuit of happiness do we need to watch what we are storing. And we need to watch what we are seeing. But we also need to watch who we are serving. Because he said you can't serve two masters. You're going to love the one and hate the other. And so my brothers and sisters, you need to watch who you are serving. If you're serving anyone or anything that doesn't line up with the will and ways of God, then you need to decide who you're going to serve. You need to have a moment like Joshua and declare this day whom you're going to serve. And Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And I need to know, is there anybody listening to me this morning who can testify that as for me and my house, I'm not going to serve money, but I'm going to serve the master. If that's your testimony, can you give God praise right where you are? But not only... Do we need to watch what we're storing? Watch what we're seeing. Watch what or who we're serving. But we also need to uh, make sure that we are not stressing. Because he says in verse 25, I tell you, don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about uh, what you're going to eat. Worrying can't add one cubit to your stature. In other words, worrying and stressing won't help your situation. Now, it may seem like I'm preaching to the choir because you've experienced that. You've worried and it didn't help, but that hadn't stopped you from worrying. And so I'm trying to help you to stop from worrying by showing you in the word of God that worry ain't what the child of God is supposed to do. I've told you before in Bible study that worrying is stewing without doing. By worrying, you can't change the past nor the future. You can only make your present situation more miserable and cause you to be a bad witness for Christ. Because whether you realize it or not, people are watching you and I. They're watching to see how we live and handle situations. And if we are supposed to be children of God, and we're always walking around with a frown, always worrying, always acting like chicken little that the sky is falling and I don't know what I'm going to do, then the people in the world are looking at us and looking at our God like he must be pretty pathetic. Because you don't even trust him. You're walking around biting your nails and scratching your head and pacing the floor all night long. And if you don't trust him, then how are you going to try to encourage me to trust him? Oh, my brothers and sisters, you can't change it by worrying about it. If you can change it, then change it. But if you can't change it, then don't worry about it because you can't change it anyway. Now, if you can change it and you don't change it, how can I say this nicely? Something wrong with you. If you can change it, but instead of changing it, you decide that you're going to stew without doing something is wrong with you but lest I hold you too long 
Not only should we watch what we are storing, and not only should we watch what we're seeking, I'm sorry, seeing, and not only should we watch what we are serving and make sure we're not stressing, but we also finally need to watch what we are seeking. That's what verse 33 says. If we want to pursue happiness and find it, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness and all these things will be given. All, all, all this stuff that we are trying to store up all this stuff that we think gives our life value and meaning, but really doesn't. Jesus says that if you and I want to pursue real happiness, and if we want to find real happiness, then he says, watch what your story. Watch what you're seeing. Watch who you're serving. And uh, make sure that you ain't stressing. And then he says, we need to watch what we are seeking. In other words, we need to get our priorities straight. So that we can be successful. If you want to find happiness that will not only last for time, but eternity, you won't find it in the bottle. You won't find it in a pill. You won't find it in the mall. You won't find it in your closet you won't find it in your bling bling you won't find it in how much money you have you won't find it under a skirt or in somebody's pants you won't find it in your portfolio your network or your net worth you won't find it on Instagram, on TikTok, or on Twitter. You won't find it. You won't find true happiness in any of these fleeting, frail, faulty, and fragile things that the world seeks. My brothers and sisters, if we want true happiness, then it's found in God. Seek ye first, not second, not third, my brothers and sisters, but first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God must be the priority because it's in God that we live, that we move, and have our being. And my brothers and sisters, if you seek him, I guarantee that you'll find him because his word says in Deuteronomy 4.29 that we shall find the Lord if we seek him with all our heart and soul. And because our God is merciful, my brothers and sisters, he will neither abandon us nor destroy us. God said that in order to come to him, that we must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And I got a question for you this morning. Do you believe that he is? And do you believe that he's a rewarder of those who diligently 
really seeking? Now, I got another question for you. Are you seeking God? Are you seeking him and his righteousness? Because if you are, my brothers and sisters, if you seek him, you'll find him. You'll find him. Jesus said, I will not uh, for any reason cast you out or reject anyone who comes unto me. That's why the hymn writer said, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. My brothers and sisters, can you give God praise? Because the Lamb of God says, come. If you seek him, you'll find happiness. He'll put running in your feet and ain't nobody chasing you. He'll put clapping in your hands. He'll have tears running down your face and ain't nobody bothering you because you'll be crying tears of joy. Is there anybody that can testify that the joy of the Lord is your strength and you got strength because you sought him and you found him. Did you find him? Give God praise. Say yeah. 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 Oh yeah. God is worth pursuing. If you want real happiness, this Thanksgiving and the rest of your life, make sure that you're pursuing God. Make sure that you watch what you're storing. Watch how you're seeing. Watch who you're serving. Watch that you're not stressing. And watch who you are seeking. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. You can pursue happiness, uh, but you got to pursue the right someone. If you pursue theos, then all the things. He'll give those to you. He wants a relationship. He, he wants you to have the abundant life. He wants you to live on the right side of the comma. And you can live on the right side of the comma if you decide that you're going to watch what you're storing. Watch how you're seeing. Watch who you're serving. Watch that you ain't stressing and make sure you watch what you're seeking. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given unto you. God bless you. I love you. Happy Thanksgiving. Let's go. I don't know what you're going through, but we stopped by to tell you that what's in front of you is bigger than what's behind you. Your destiny, your promise, your future. You might as well shout before you...